Welcome to What's in Store, the show where we cover hot topics at the cross section of retail and real estate. I'm Carly Iacono, and I'm joined by my co host, Chris Ressa. Chris, welcome. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? Can't complain. Life's good. Not as good as you, though. I just heard you were at a celebrity golf outing. Now, I know we talk about golf a lot, but uh, what? I'm jealous. So it's not a celebrity golf outing. I was at a golf outing where there were celebrities. I think there's a difference. I don't know. It sounds the same, but okay, go on, go on. Uh, So OJ Anderson, former New York Giants football player, puts on uh, a golf outing for one of his foundations. And, you know, he's got a lot of friends that are former Giants, former Knicks, and uh, knows other celebrities that are you know, want to support him. And they were part of the golf outing. I was invited to go to the golf outing. I was in a foursome uh, with, you know, business colleagues. And so uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, Fancy. Yeah. Very fancy. Oh, I'm far from fancy. (laughs) But it was pretty cool. Uh, I got a picture with Charles Oakley. I saw Ja Rule. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So. All right. I have nothing to compare to that. So I think we'll just uh, jump into today's content. Awesome. We are talking today about why, uh, maybe not why, we're talking today about the fact that Americans just will not stop eating out and what this means for retail real estate. It's a fun topic uh, and something that we really haven't covered from just a granular real estate uh, and restaurant perspective. So I'm excited. Me too. I want to lay the scene a little bit with some stats. You know how I love my stats. Um, just some some numbers. So we kind of all frame what this really means, like how big the industry is and what we're talking about. So I'm going to start with I, the top line, I think, most shocking stat, which is that restaurants are projected to be at $1.1 trillion in sales by the end of 2024 this year per the NRA the National Restaurant Association. So that is a huge number and a big jump from last year. What do you think is driving all this? So I think, you know, the restaurant sector has really, you know, had a boon from coming out of COVID. We all thought like every restaurant was going to close. They all didn't. Uh, And there was a lot of ideation that happened, a lot of innovation. People really love the experience of going out to eat. There's so many new remodeled restaurants. There's so many new concepts. Uh, There's so many different food groups, so many different price points that people are loving going out to eat. So much that we have this amazing sort of trajectory that has far surpassed grocery sales. And yeah. it, it's just a cultural phenomenon at this point. Yeah. I think that is fascinating that we're spend we're spending obviously we we had breached that number like where restaurant sales were higher than grocery sales some years back and then with covid obviously it tipped back and now it's come back. Um and restaurant tours continue to want to grow. I, I that's what's you know which speaks to the demand out there, right? We did, as Americans, we did 10% more uh, restaurant leases than we did, or 10% more restaurants opened in 23 than they did in 22. 19% of all retail leases were restaurants. So they still want to grow because right. there's demand out there. They're seeing the demand for people going out to eat. You throw in technology and what technology does to the restaurant, and I, you know, it's a really compelling story for restaurants. So let's go phase by phase here. I want to talk about the real estate perspective. I want to talk about some of the new concepts and why we think this phenomenon is is happening at the level it is. So let's start with the the real estate piece. You mentioned that there were 19% of the retail leases signed last year were to restaurants of some sort, right? That could be fast food. It could be fine dining and everything in between. Everything in between. We're grouping them all together. So 19% of the availability eaten up by restaurants first- do you think we have room to grow that number? So given how successful, and and obviously there are restaurants that are challenged. There's a ton of staffing issues. There's a ton of issues going on. There's no doubt. And inflation is out there. Challenges, no doubt, just like every industry. 
But the fact that they're comp, the industry is comping up as a whole, you know, you can separate fine dining out from QSR and fast casual and all these things and say pinpoint some are doing better than others and all that. But just as a concept, people want to go out to eat. And so when I look at the amount of leases that were done at 20%, um, in one category for restaurants might feel like a lot, but given the success and given the fact that those are more sales than our grocery stores in America, I think there's probably some juice left to squeeze out of spaces and out of shopping centers and freestanding buildings for some more restaurants. You need the right operators. You need the right concepts, right? There's still a high failure rate of restaurants, Uh, but I do think there's more room for restaurants in America, given how much we love to go out to eat. So there were two other trends that I think are kind of driving this that you've touched on in in previous months. One was the rise of franchising, right? So as more concepts are franchised, it becomes easier for people to start a restaurant business that maybe wouldn't have gone it at their own on their own. And then you have the other side of that, which is the rise in entrepreneurship, people starting their own businesses, less demand for long term corporate America jobs, or right? people want more flexibility. So there's this rise in, in the entrepreneurial kind of spirit in America, too. So I could see both of those trends coming together for kind of explaining the new business openings. And to your point, there's still a lot of failures, but if you have more people coming in and really pushing for that, then I, I think your net positive is obviously going to be there. And for sure. And maybe it should be like totally that, you know, we're really innovating in food because, by the way, grocery stores are doing well in America. Right. Right. We're not, stores, not grocery, saying that grocery, grocery dead, stores right? are doing well. We love grocery stores. Yeah. They're like, you know the grocery stores are a foundation of like a lot of our properties of and we're not saying that grocery stores um are bad or you know doing badly they are doing well i just think there's you know going out to eat has become not only something to do because it's part of you know your three meals and daily routine but it has really become entertainment in the fabric of our society and whereas maybe at one time it was for a piece of the society, but now it's for, you know, entertainment for a lot of society. And I've been reading a lot about the the growth in different segments generationally, which I think is so interesting. So we've gotten really good, of course, at data interpretation and understanding the consumer with all the tools out there. So there are now targeted limited time promotions, targeted concepts specifically for certain generations, right? The younger generations are finding new things on TikTok, and that's driving food trends and what they want to try and this fear of missing out and wanting to go, even if it's just for a donut or what it's probably not a donut because it's much too basic. Whatever the new, you know, crazy thing is, they want to go try it. They want to post about it. That's part of their experience. And then you have the all the way up to, you know, the older boomer generations that want value. They want to go out. They want to be catered to and have a different experience with a completely opposite type of promotion. So I think the data behind all of this and the targeting has been incredibly successful, but it's very different. By the generation yeah i think i think the other thing is you know we've talked about this qsr and i would say this like what's the difference between fast casual qsr and fast food hmm well i could give you a definition <laughs> but i feel like anytime you search that they're they're different yeah. yeah so we we look at we define those in leases at times because right. there might be restrictions but the point I'm making is generally speaking, quality and whatever your definition of quality is, one of the things that's helped, wh- whether it's taste, health, whatever your definition of quality is, freshness, quality food at the ready is more available today than it's ever been. And so people, part of that increase is people paying for time, right? Um, and the grocery stores too have, you know, dove right into that. There's a huge prepared food sections in many grocery stores, right? You know, 
we use those a lot where we'll go and we'll grab those grab and goes at the grocery store and those will be a meal instead of cooking four days a week we'll cook three and use that one you know the other day of the week um but i think that when you you talked about the generations i think one of the things that's helped the limited time offers and all this really interesting promotions is the fact that quality food whatever your definition of quality is is much more readily available than it ever was to the average american um maybe the franchising world you know was a catalyst for that to happen or whatever but i think that is part of the reason and people are paying for some of their time back i would say right and i don't know about your family but we definitely have some takeout nights we have some eating out but our our majority still in my household and you know i would call it pretty traditional four family home is for dinner at least and breakfast for dinner and breakfast is things that we're making at the house from the grocery store typically I would agree with that, but then you have examples like you can buy um, peanut pad thai for $16 on takeout or you can spend $48 to buy all the ingredients and make it yourself. So I have moments like that where I'm like, oh, I want to I want to make something different. I want to try something different. And then you go to the store and buy all these things that you're not in your regular rotation. You're like, well, that was absurd, right? That yeah. costs me much more. So I, I think there's – if you're experiencing or you're exploring a different cuisine or less traditional ingredients, it's often more cost-effective to, to order out or to eat out. But your basic staples, I think people will continue to, to eat at home, but to surprisingly less and less numbers. I think – yeah, I mean, I don't know – what does it cost for you and your daughters to go grab lunch? Uh, they have very sophisticated palates. <laughs> so they're like, I'll have the grilled salmon and the roasted vegetables or the side of like aioli, you know. Whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a lot. I, 7500 bucks. Easy. Yeah. Okay, 100 bucks. Mm-hmm. So, but at the grocery store with a really healthy meal mm-hmm. for $100 for lunch, we can feed our family at a minimum for the week, right? On lunches. On lunches, okay. right? So you, I, I'm getting seven for the price of one is my right. point, right? And maybe my numbers are a little off. But I know, I, it's always that ratio, but yes. Yeah, right? Yes, I get there's so, no specialty items, yeah. So I think there's, we definitely eat out and we probably eat out more today than pre-pandemic. Now that's partially generational where we were at that point where our kids, like you never wanted to leave the house because right. it was a nightmare going out. But, but now they're old enough where they can sit at the table and have a nice meal. So I think that, you know, we pick and choose some spots. Like on a Saturday night, we'll go out. Or even if we're not going out, we're ordering in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we still are pretty traditionalist and have a lot of grocery. But what I, what I'm, I guess the punchline is our restaurant spend has gone up. But I'm not sure our grocery spend has gone down. Exactly. And I think another sort of element to this is we've created these other categories that we didn't know we needed before, like the specialty beverages, you know, the things that all these new words like, uh, what what is it? Swicy. It's my new favorite word, (laughs) spicy. It's sweet and spicy. There's a spicy beverage that, you know, everyone needs to try. So we have all these new needs that really weren't there like right. need is a broad term or a generous term let's say so i think we have eating then we have experiences and now we have all these other categories which is part of the reason that we're seeing so much uh, demand in new space um, leasing from the dessert category the beverage category things that are sort of ancillary and are just adding to the spend but not taking away from another category in the process yeah i think i i don't know what maybe it's other forms of entertainment i don't know what's gone down that we've right. spent down but we clearly have spent less on something else you know and it's probably incremental and little i don't see it because he, our grocery spend's gone up and our restaurant spend as well so uh it's interesting and one of the things that's for the grocery spend is you know we don't go to just one spot we go to so many different places not. to get everything right so anyway yeah, make it as complex as there you go 
I think another thing that, that's interesting that we should talk about is the rise of all of the delivery apps, right? The, the access to prepared food is, is continuing to increase. And as the fees come down, the efficiency goes up, you have just endless options, right? And it may be that previously a family or an individual, it doesn't matter, didn't want pizza or Chinese and that was it, right? So if you didn't want pizza or Chinese, what were you getting for takeout? back in the day. Now, of course, that's, you can get everything. You can get everything, uh, you know, efficiently. So. so I would say if I was down on any part of the restaurant space, and I say down, wrong word, if I was, you know, thought there was some softness to me, I would be, it's in the delivery app slash space because when you know you mentioned the fees it it's expensive to order in for a lot of those all those unique new things it's not the old pizza delivery that we had growing up it's it's much more expensive and the less you get like mm, the more the fees are right if you of course right proportionately it starts right. to get it starts to get tough right like if you're just home and you you want to doordash a cup of coffee it's like a you know, I don't know what it is, but fifteen, twenty dollar cup of coffee. That's crazy. Right? I would never do that. Yeah. So I think at the end of the day, that that need has some work to do before they can compete at scale with those apps. So I just only think that improves at the real estate level the restaurant success. And I don't think it has to be mutually exclusive. Maybe not. Maybe it's and, not or. Picking up from the physical location. Sure, absolutely. I think anytime you're improving access and efficiency, you're opening it up to more consumers. Yeah. So Fair enough. As that improves, the fees come down. Maybe it's a a brand or a concept. You keep saying fees come down. How are the fees coming down? I don't see. Competition, right? Maybe you have more delivery points closer to the consumer. Maybe the tip structure changes. I don't really use the service, so I'm not sure. But I think it's gonna. I, I, you think fees are gonna go up? I, so like, it's like delivery fees. Like I keep want, like how did if oil prices move up, how do delivery fees come down? It gets internalized, I guess. How does Amazon do it for free? I mean, they have a, like, they, it's a totally different business model. They're not, they're in a totally different business model than everyone else. So yeah, I, from the point of how do you do it profitably? I think it's really challenging. That's all. And I think maybe we haven't figured that out yet. Maybe yeah. it's not DoorDash, right? Maybe it's not a third party. Um, Don't know. It's probably drones. It's probably drones. Probably there you drones. go. <laughs> okay. Problem solved. Problem Good. solved. Problem solved. We'll move on. Um, so why do you think all of this activity and growth and demand in the restaurant space is good for retail real estate? It's one thing to eat up space, but do we want these tenants there? I think the, you know, we're getting more, I think a couple of things. One, we're getting new fresh concepts to properties. That's good. We're getting uh, new consumers who are coming to properties. I think we're getting, I think one of the things that's helping is overall you're getting, you're continually see more sophisticated restaurant operators. You know, there was a, you know, we're not getting a ton of like just a, you know, a, a chef who wants to be a restaurateur and, and that there's nothing wrong with that. But we are getting sophisticated business people who have, who want to, you know, get into this because of what they think is the growth. And so I think that's interesting, which is, you know, we're getting, you know, really strong operators. We're getting new concepts, new consumers. And historically, when you get strong business operators, they increase traffic, they bring new concepts, and you get new consumers. Like, that's always good for retail real estate. Are you worried about the turnover in your centers if you were to take on maybe a new concept or an unproven restaurant? Do you worry so, about that turnover? I think that is pretty deal specific. It depends on like what were the deal terms. But what I what I can tell you is here was we were looking at a deal where this restaurant operator it was a local operator wanted a specific piece of space in our property pretty prominent space and in your world i would say they came in over ask 
Okay, we don't say that in leasing too much, but they they were willing to pay a significant amount of money for the space. Now we had to invest some in the space, but the deal was pretty compelling. It required us to move the tenant in there into a different piece of space, which was accretive because the space they were moving to wasn't a great space. But one of the things we looked at is like, is just this just another restaurant? Right. Or is this like the coolest restaurant within 25 miles? This person had two locations. Like, let's start to like how much impact will they have other than just on our rent roll? And I think, you know, and so maybe if that's the case, you're willing to take some more risk on the because you think they're going to have a significant impact. Um, but just spending a lot of money on a low credit tenant with unproven operating history, like you're taking a risk and yeah, you're probably worried in, in that scenario. So you're balancing demand for the space, right? Overall vacancy levels, right? In that specific area, in that market, how competitive you think it is with other concepts, how risky you feel the credit is, and then really what the draw to the center may be for whatever duration they're there versus the risk profile. Yeah, I think and the TI. And the, I think the first thing, right, is we're looking at the economics of the deal. Does it work right, for the credit, right? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing we're looking for. I think the, th the second thing we're looking at is like operating history, right? And then I think the piece is like, well, what do they do for the property? Is it getting us to the next place for over the next 10 years? How are you seeing TI requirements shift? Are you, are you seeing them go up? Are they going down? Are tenants being more flexible and asking for less because they want the space? Any shift in that as this becomes more competitive? Are we talking just restaurants or just deals? Just restaurants. I'm not sure I have like a, a specific trend for you but what i will say is that we're i don't have a stat anecdotally it feels like we have more restaurants investing capital in their spaces than we did in years past right now they're investing their own capital yeah. not asking you for it yeah good more the, I didn't say that. I said oh. they're in. <laughs> what I said is we're having more restaurants invest more capital, feels okay. like, than they had previously. That doesn't mean they're not also asking for capital for us. That doesn't mean that we're not doing landlord work. It just means that the build outs are more expensive. No, it just means that some restaurateurs are putting in more capital. Okay. Themselves. Yeah. I feel like that would make the state space stickier, you would hope. Depending on how that capital was raised, yes. Right. Very good point. Yeah. Very good point. And that is something that kind of ties into what you were saying about the operators being more sophisticated. Yeah. But I think that's an interesting piece. Like, who's the capital behind it? It's not just a local family opening their first restaurant. There's more layers to it. Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Let's talk about a few headwinds to this space. Uh, we're obviously very bullish on it. We love the new concepts. We think it drives traffic. Yep. We touched on turnover briefly. Um, I know there's a lot of chatter about labor costs, inflation. What other headwinds do you think we might have to deal with from, from the, the restaurant space? So the one that we hear, at least at a real estate level, the most is the labor issue. Right. Like, you know, I think that's one of the biggest ones. Um, clearly, everyone's trying to evolve with technology. And so I think for some, that's a headwind. For some, that's, an, that's a tailwind. Right. I think that's- They're ahead of the game already. Right, I think yeah. for some, that's a headwind. Some, that's a tailwind, right? For Domino's, I think technology is a tailwind, right? I totally agree. Right. It's keeping for, them relevant. Right, for, for others, it's a headwind because it's a huge cost to invest in and they haven't done it before. And so I think that's one that's interesting. Okay, technology, um, labor, we're not sure if that's gonna moderate. How about inflation, cost of goods, any concerns around that? Yeah, I think there's, it's, you know, we've all been to the restaurant where 
it says, do you know, you get some flyer and it says due to inflation, we had to increase our prices. I saw it at a bagel place, right? So that's that's clearly an issue and clearly it's an impacting inflation's happening more at the restaurant level than it is at the grocery store today, correct? Mm -hmm, correct. Right. So I think that's obviously gonna put a you know, get people to watch. I don't know if that means they pull back or that means they trade down. Right. Right. In the retail space, we talk about trade down often. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I've seen so much about trade down in restaurants, but I think we might be in a new world order where you might start to see that if that's how it goes, rather than them not go out to eat. I think you might start to see trade down because I think people like going out to eat. I think you're exactly right. And what's so fascinating about restaurants are there are so many different levels. Yeah, right. you can go all the way from the most premium fine dining to fast casual, you know, down to fast food and anywhere in between with all these concepts. So it's not like one part of the market is growing and the other stagnating. It's new concepts at every price point, every level. So and you and, you know, I think in that world, too, I think. Looks also are deceiving. So. My family, we love like an amazing hole in the wall where it just right. is amazing. Like there's a, we go down in South Jersey Shore to um, Avalon many weekends in the summer. And there's this uh, restaurant like on the border of Wildwood. It's like a, it's, it's a legit seafood shack on the water. It's called Hooked Up. And I like, I normally don't like, swordfish that much it's like tough it's not great to eat good to know uh and <laughs> good to know <laughs> and like i we i leave there every time and like i, I go to my father and i'm like do you think this guy knows he has the absolute no questions asked best swordfish in america hands down right, right? and yeah. so uh it's a phenomenal piece of fish but so the point is like you never know with restaurants you can right find that amazing piece of swordfish i think i meant more for the chains right the national chains sure. that are a consistent experience but yes that's the fun of it that there's yeah. always these hidden gems and hole in the wall sure that overperform right? yeah and some underperform but you know you can find them at different price points which is great yeah for sure the the we're not short concepts right now and i think that's really one of our concluding points is that Although there are headwinds, we don't think Americans are going to stop eating out. In fact, this trend is going to continue accelerating. And although we have higher prices, we have consumer debt rising, we have a lot of issues, labor costs, new concepts are coming in in the restaurant space at all these different price points. And we think that the dollars are going to be continually allocated to eating out yeah. long term. That's what it looks like. Let's end on a fun note. What is, we just said swordfish, so I don't know, I guess this can count as your answer, but what is something that you have recently tried that you really enjoyed and maybe weren't expecting or a new concept that you really liked? So. Do you need the Jeopardy music? Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things we didn't touch on, um, Yelp has been tracking, tracks, this data about they all these new restaurants and to give everyone context i believe they said what was it 53,000 restaurants opened last year is that what that's what you said yeah crazy is something crazy yeah. if you look at yelp it's something crazy and that was more than the previous year and the three biggest growing categories were um hot pot okay creperies and desserts and cool I had in, I, I had been to Korean barbecue long ago, but I hadn't been to one of like these newer age hot pot restaurants uh, that continue to open up. And I was recently in Chicago at a property we have uh, called the Randhurst Village, and then we have a restaurant tour who took a former Smoky Bones in a six thousand square foot space, um, uh, Mr. Kimchi, and it was awesome we had lunch we needed to roll out of there but it was awesome i think really the the question is you went you loved it it was a great experience will you work this into your normal family rotation or is this a novelty that you go once and that's for any of the concepts right 
there's a big buzz around these new ideas and I'm exactly the same way. I love trying new places. I'm always up for a type of food or an experience I've never had. Absolutely love trying new things. But will I go, and maybe for hot pot you will, but will you go continuously past that first push? So this is this is like a personal question for me? I mean, no, it was more like general. Like, do we think consumers, but yes, tell me about hot pot. Will you go back to hot pot? So with your I, live in, I live in New Jersey and that place is in Chicago. So I'm I don't- sure there's another one. Uh, okay. I don't think we're going to that one as a family. I think for us- uh, it's a, it's a simple one, which is how we have been talking about one of the reasons retail real estate is so powerful is because it's closest to the consumer. So I think the entertainment of like the big entertainment, the novelty is like the 45 minute away. But the, the place that I you know, genre cuisine agnostic five minutes away will frequent often. Right. So for us, I think that's the, the difference where, uh, well, yeah, if it's could be a Mexican restaurant, it could be an Asian cuisine. It could be Greek five minutes away. Often 45 minutes away. Novelty. I love that you said that, like a true real estate investor. Uh, uh, You're like the rings of, uh, right? But that's how I think we, relevance that's how we operate, yeah. Five and 10 miles, but there you go. it's 45 minutes and 10 Drive minutes. time. Drive time, drive time. There's probably a middle band in there too. Like probably. Nice, but not except, you know, okay. I like it. What about you? You're not wrong. I love new experiences, like I mentioned. Would I go 45 minutes? Mm, that's a stretch, right. probably, right? 30 but I, for local places I like, I might extend a little farther than 5, 10, 15, I think. But I think it's a great way to look at it, right? You'll try anything once, but it has to be something you really love to make the effort to go back if it's not right there. Like, do you have a local pizza place that you guys... We do. Uh, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a monthly thing, a bi-weekly thing? How often do you guys... Probably like once a month, yeah. All right. So they get you 12 times a year. Right. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. We've tried other places like that one best. So right. that's the And go -to. if yeah. they were 45 minutes away. Would never go. Would never go. Right. But that's not an experience to your point. Right. That's a, a staple or a local choice. But uh, if we go out to pizza and I get to sit down with my family and, you know, where otherwise maybe kids were running in the fridge, grabbing something, going down to the playroom. I put that in the experience book. Okay. How far would you be willing to drive for good pizza? Is that the five minute? That's the five minute. Five minute band. Okay. Well, let me rephrase. No, I we have a spot that is twenty minutes away, and they have the best gluten free vegan pizza for my wife, who's gluten free and vegan. And so I would say we get that once a month, and they have like the best sauce ever. So. That's 20 minutes away. I'm not believing your five minute room then. <laughs> okay, I think it's a little farther, but yeah, yeah, that's very specific, it makes sense. Yeah. Nice. Well, I love everything that we covered. I think, you know, to conclude, there's so many positive forces at play within restaurant development, so many exciting new concepts, and it, at the end of the day, it really does bode very, very well for retail real estate, in spite of all of the challenging headwinds. So, I'm excited. Awesome. To everyone listening, that was What's in Store. Thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you again very soon. Have a great day, everyone.